Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to session seven of Peatlands Gathering 2021. My name is David Wilson. I'm your chair for this session, and I am ably assisted by Francis Macken as note taker, and the issues will be on tech and uh, timekeeping. So, in keeping with the uh, ethos of this uh, online conference, we have a very eclectic mix of talks uh, in this session. We hope you find both interesting and stimulating. Um, just quick housekeeping before, before we launch into it. If you have any questions, um, please put them into the Q&A box uh, rather than to the chat room. Um, that'll be much appreciated by both myself and Francis. So first up, we have our first uh, speaker. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Neil O'Brodicon from NUI Galway and many other hats. Um, and uh, Neil will be talking about an evidence-based policy to enable peatland restoration, biodiversity, and greenhouse gas or reduction. The floor is yours, sir. Many thanks. I hope you can hear me, uh, David. Maybe you could just acknowledge that. I'm just going to try and share the screen. Is that okay? Please do. Yeah. Okay. And we'll start the presentation. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, could you expand it out, uh, Neil, please? Yes, yes that's perfect, perfect now. That's perfect now, okay. Okay, thank you very much, David. I'll plow into it. I know I have eight minutes, so I'm going to try and stick to under that. Um, basically, I'm Neil Abelacan. I'm um, based at NUI Galway. I'm a researcher there, and I'm working on the Interreg um, Northwest Europe Care Peat Project, where I'm um, looking after the policy section of that. And the headline that we have really is rewetting bogs can save up to 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions and play a very important role in terms of saving our planet. Um, just to say the countries involved are Ireland, the UK, France, Netherlands and Belgium. Um, just in terms of policies, we've examined, we've, we've done a comprehensive uh, analysis of um, global policies and of national policies in the countries involved and indeed of local policies and particularly relating to the sites that we're actually doing the evidence based work on. Um, you know, I just single out one or two of the policies which are crucial to it. Obviously, the um, Global Peatlands Initiative is, is very poignant at the moment. Um, the European Green Deal is vital, the Common Agricultural Policy. Uh, and the UN decade of um, ecosystem restoration is hugely important and something we need to stick to. But I mean, underpinning that there, there's lots of other things such as the you know sustainable development goals, the Ramsar Convention and so on. In Ireland, the national peatland strategy is absolutely uh, crucial, as is the national climate policy. Um, I just want to get straight into the meat of this, really, because um, this, this is a slide I got from the European Environment Agency. And what it shows is something terrible, really, that from the year 2000 to the year 2018, 477 um, km squared of um, peatland was lost in Europe, in the EU. And 85% of that was in Ireland. So we're talking about over um, 40,000 hectares, which is greater than the area that um, Bordenamona is rehabilitating at the moment. So that's, that's, that's not a good thing. But note the date, 2018, because a lot has happened since then. And many of us have come together, uh, many people who are on this call have come together, including David and, and others, um, you know, to put figures towards the programme for government. There was a new government in 2020, and they thankfully have taken on a lot of the um, initiatives that people have been proposing for years. There is a huge about face in terms of, um, you know, of, of Irish policy in terms of re rewetting land. So um, in particular, on November the 20th, uh, sorry, November the 24th, 2020, the Cabinet approved 108 million funding for groundbreaking Board Namona Bog Rehabilitation Plan. Now, whether you accept these figures or not, these are the figures which are put out there, that the plan will protect the storage of 100 million tonnes of carbon, um, sequester 3.2 million tonnes um, to 2050, create 350 jobs, etc. So obviously it's working towards the, um, this, this particular plan is working towards 2050 and the need for zero carbon. So just to show, I mean, as a result of that, and also because, um, you know, in the run up to that, 
many of these fantastic projects um, rehabilitation projects have happened um, all around Ireland and you notice the sort of um, you know there's a little a few in Kerry in in what I would call Healy Ray country and um, there's the, the Midlands is very important there's a few in the north of Ireland and down the west coast Galway Mayo Donegal and so on so just the second string um, of work that we've actually done in terms of policy is um, we teamed up with Wetlands International and Greif's Wild Meyer Centre because it was it was hugely poignant that the common agricultural policy was being discussed um, in the Parliament um, during the Kerpeet project. And uh, Greifswald obviously are, are a tremendous organisation. Um, they, they put together these maps in terms of sort of European emissions and the, um, you know, the, the European um, areas where, where peatlands are prevalent in Europe. And you notice that Ireland is quite strong in both, obviously, because we've got a lot of peatland, 21% roughly. Um, we met with a lot of MEPs, we let, met with a lot of uh, Commission people, um, including, as you see, Mairead McGuinness, who's our Commissioner now, and Peter Yar, who was the Rapporteur for the uh, Envy Agency. And the key points we brought across were eligibility of farmed wet peatlands, phasing out of cap payments for drained peatlands, and certainly enhancement of the RBAPs um, schemes, which are very strong in Ireland in particular. And we've had a lot of good talks about those over the last few days. So we put together a position paper, and I suppose the key headline there really is that um, in, in terms of agriculture, by simply re-wetting 3% of EU agricultural lands, we can save up to 25% of agricultural emissions. And that, that is hugely important for farmers, and it really needs to be brought across because there's, there's, there's great opportunities there, and it's lovely to see um, projects like Farm Peat emerging now. Um, but in Ireland, you know, we're talking about a bigger figure, which is roughly a third can be can be uh, saved by about seven percent of the agricultural land being um, rewetted or or restored. So just to show the sort of machinations of the whole thing, I mean, the the NGOs and the science um, organisations, we were sort of people from about eighteen different countries throughout Europe uh, put together the the various proposals. And, you know, we came up with effective protection of wetland and peatlands for the um, GAEC2, which was good in agricultural environment commissions. It was a protocol. And, you know, the, the commission basically adopted it. It was watered down by, um, of course, by the parliament a little bit, and then was absolutely trashed to bits by the council and more or less turned on its head and made meaningless. So that's that's the normal process. But then, um, you know, a lot of machinations happened. And then, thankfully, on the 25th of June, I think this is really, really crucially important to all of us going forward. Um, Franz Timmermans, the executive vice president of the parliament, who's responsible for the Green Deal, basically said this. He said throughout the negotiations, the Commission has worked for a new common agricultural policy that can support the Green Deal. The agreement reached today marks the start of a real shift in how we practice agriculture in Europe. In the next years, we will protect wetlands and peatlands and um, dedicate more farmland to biodiversity, boost organic farming, open up new income sources for farmers via carbon farming and begin to redress inequalities in the distribution of income support. And I see I've one minute remaining. Left. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So um, just just what are the next steps that we've got? I, I'd love to talk to you all day, but I can't. Um, eight minutes is what we all have. Um, so just we're, we're working heavily on carbon farming framework. Um, we've just um, published a deliverable on that. And there's a really good carbon farm that we're working with in the UK. Um, we're doing an EU white paper on eco credits. Um, we're doing we're, we're setting up. Um, we, we can actually announce quite soon that we're actually working on a European peatlands database. So a lot of the lot of the points a lot of people have made have been quite poignant in that regard. Um, there's many politiculture investigations going on and hopefully that will um, work in Ireland as well. Wetland farming, obviously, politiculture. And finally, we, we'll be conducting a European policy workshop in Brussels in the new year, and it'll bring together um, people from a number of different countries. We did a stakeholder workshops in the five countries of Carpeet, and these are the, um, I, I don't have time to go into them, but these are the key policy gaps, barriers and enablers. We did that for all countries and we're going to be doing it for Europe. So thank you very much um, and thanks very much for the fantastic conference so far. Thank you very much, uh, Neil. That was fascinating and so much important things uh, 
you've come taught so many important things that we're going to be facing, I think, in the uh, in the years to come, particularly from eco schemes, carbon farming, um, all very important. And uh, I look forward to discussing maybe more of that at the uh, at the end of the um, at the end of this uh, questions and answers session. So if you bear with me a second, I have to switch hats um, from chair to presenter. So let me just share my screen here. Hopefully that's all good. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. Um, yeah, uh, as I introduced myself at the beginning, uh, my name is David Wilson. Uh, I'm an environmental uh, consultant. Uh, and for the last 20 years or so, I have been mainly working in measuring, modeling, and reporting greenhouse gas emissions from a range of peatland land use uh, categories. Uh, and for this talk this morning, uh, I just want to give you a little flavor of some of the results from our study at Moya Wood uh, in County Galway. Uh, and just to acknowledge the, the very generous funding uh, from both EPA and both the Mona at different times over the five year period that enabled uh, this uh, uh, work to continue. Uh, and also to acknowledge the, the very many uh, uh, colleagues uh, involved in this work, uh, many of them who have presented either today or, or yesterday. So just to give a little bit of background first, um, we know from the most recent work uh, carried out by the AUGA project, the EPA funded AUGA project, that there's around 2.3 billion tonnes of carbon uh, stored in, in Irish peatlands. And these are distributed across a whole range of land use categories. In particular, the, the, the peat extraction has impacted uh, around 23% of the uh, the uh, area uh, of Irish peatlands. And this has also uh, uh, important uh, impacts on the carbon uh, stored in these, uh, in these sites as well, these degraded sites. So we know uh, from work in the past that drainage uh, leads to a, a significant uh, shift in the carbon dynamics within the system because of the very deep oxic peat uh, above the water table, uh, CO2 emissions are increased. Uh, methane emissions probably decrease, but are still significant in drainage ditches. Uh, and we also have losses of uh, dissolved organic carbon, uh, particulate organic carbon and dissolved inorganic carbon in the fluvial uh, uh, losses from the site. So significant changes from a natural site uh, uh, to any site that undergoes drainage. So what can we do about this? And I think everybody at this point in time is very aware and cognizant of the term rewetting. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, define it as a deliberate act or action of raising the water table on the drain so as to re-establish water saturated conditions. And that, this is very important wording and as Bernard Hyde alluded to yesterday, unless it's a management action, there's a human influence involved in it, um, any, any such uh, uh, measurements uh, or or carbon uh, data that we get from these sites are inadmissible because they're not managed. This is a very deliberate managed action. And because it's managed action, we would expect to see the, the results of rewetting peatland projects in terms of carbon and greenhouse gas uh, dynamics reflected in inventories in, in the years and possibly the decades ahead. So it's a very important, um, it's a very important definition um, and one that we, we must keep in our minds as well. We'll just move just to our study site. Um, it's a, a former raised bog in Moya Wood, County Galway, around 200 hectares. It's a the Mona site. Um, it was drained in the 1980s uh, with a typical 15-meter uh, uh, linear drainage. Uh, but somewhat unusually from what we would all consider to be typical the Mona sites, the vegetation was left on the surface. Um, and obviously, at some point, decision was made not to open this uh, site up for peat extraction. In 2012, under the guidance of the Bournemouth Ecology Team, um, it was re-wetted, so the, the drains were blocked. Uh, and we were very fortunate at that time to be able to come in and uh, to start greenhouse gas studies uh, immediately uh, that uh, drain blocking had been uh, instigated. And it ran for five years. We typically, uh, we measured with the chamber measurements. So we measured uh, three greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. 
while at the same time we measured the vegetation composition was as important because the site was obviously going through very dynamic changes, not just in greenhouse gases, but also in the, the composition of the, uh, the plants. The site was instrumented, instrumented to capture all the variables, environmental variables that we require in order to model the fluxes. So these were, these were modeled using multiple regression techniques where the fluxes themselves were the relationship between the fluxes and soil temperature, water level, light and leaf area index uh, were all carried out and then ca calculated in such a way that we can, we can uh, produce a carbon and greenhouse gas uh, balance uh, for those areas. We looked at two different areas. Uh, we, uh, we set up collars in the, uh, the, the drained margins uh, that had remained drained uh, even after drain blocking in the main site. And we also went to an area that was rewet, as you can see from this upper photograph here. We ran a transect just across a bay. So there's, there is one uh, collar in the drainage ditch and uh, there's eight collars in running across the drainage bay. So we see for our results that rewetting was extremely successful uh, here at Moyer Wood. If we look at the dotted line at the top, we see that we're into the, uh, the Goldilocks zone, as Shane Regan mentioned yesterday, where the, the water table is in, around, above uh, the peat surface uh, for pretty much the whole five year period, with the exception of a couple of periods in uh, summer in 2013 and 2014. In contrast, the water level in the drain margins, uh, much, much lower, 30, 40 centimeters uh, lower than the re wet itself. Two minutes remaining, David. Thank you. Uh, in terms of uh, carbon, the, uh, the drained area was a CO2 source, um, varied between years uh, in response to soil temperatures. Uh, the rewetted area was a CO2 sink, which was great to see, uh, a small sink in year one, the black line at the top, uh, and eventually settled down at a very significant sink uh, by years uh, uh, four and five, three, four and five. Strong methane emissions in the rewetted area, uh, not so much in the drained area, uh, particularly in late uh, mid to late summer in response to maximum vegetation production and soil temperature. When we tot up all the numbers, we see the five year average was a very, very healthy 103.7 grams of carbon, uh, which equates to around a ton of carbon per hectare per year, or just under four tons of CO2 per year. And compare that to our maybe our target site of Glen Car Blanket Bog, we see we're twice as much uh, CO2 sequestered, but crucially five times as much methane released. If we take that methane's uh, climate warming impact into account, we see that the, the, the drained and rewetted areas still have a warming effect on the climate, but crucially rewetting has reduced the impact by around 15% in only five years. And we're certainly set the site on a trajectory uh, to climate cooling as evidenced by the uh, natural sites in the green box here. So just the key points we, for the rewetted areas, at least, uh, we are CO2 sink, methane source, cru crucially nitrous ox oxide neutral. We don't have any idea at this point in time of what DOC or fluvial losses are from the site, nor do we really know what the whole site is producing in terms of a greenhouse gas budget, and that's work we're ongoing at the moment. Take home messages, I think, rewetting has a huge potential to reduce peatland carbon losses uh, and certainly create conditions for carbon sequestration with the high water level and, crucially, the reintroduction of, of sphagnum mosses and is a very, very important climate change mitigation tool. Just quickly, as they say, a photo has uh, more than a thousand words. Just, uh, this was tweeted by uh, Flo last week, and you get a real sense of just how the, uh, uh, the vegetation has uh, really recovered uh, at this particular point in time. So thank you very much. Uh, and I hope I didn't go over, over time. And uh, just give me a second to uh, get back into chairing mode. Okay, so our next uh, our next presenter is uh, Mark McCory of Bordenamona, and Mark will be uh, presenting and talking about uh, the very exciting Peatlands Climate Action Scheme. Away you go, Mark. Thanks, David. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, you just need to go into presenter mode. 
Let's bear with me. Just at the bottom right is probably the easiest one. Yeah. Perfect. Thank now, you. lovely. Um, thank you. I'm sure uh, great to be here and uh, uh, hello to everybody. Uh, I wish we were all together really, but sure uh, uh, these are the, the times we're uh, living in at the moment uh, with um, COVID and so on. Uh, as David said, I'm going to talk about uh, Borden and Mona Peatland Rehabilitation and the Peatland Climate Action Scheme. So obviously we know peat, uh, Borden and Mona stopped um, peat harvesting. Uh, we, you know, we made that uh, formal announcement there uh, at the start of uh, um, 20, um, tw um, 2020. And uh, like Borden and Mona, you know, this is a huge change for Borden and Mona. Obviously we've been in peat extraction for uh you know 70 80 years and now we're we're moving away from all that and the company is moving towards you know becoming more sustainable moving uh to address some of these climate action issues um via uh you know development of re renewable energy and so on but we have all these peatlands and we understand the issues of peat and peatlands and rewetting peatlands. So in terms of peatland rehabilitation, obviously, uh, like we had a requirement there through our EP, uh, EPA, IPC licenses to rehabilitate these bogs. But now um, PCAS is really trying to go beyond that in terms of, you know, really trying to maximize and optimize benefits of peatland rewetting. So what is the scheme? Uh, obviously, it's a it's a massive investment by the government. Uh, the it's it's really the footprint uh, will be at thirty three thousand hectares. Uh, this is very important for Borden Mona in relation to supporting uh, and just transition uh, three hundred and fifty jobs. And obviously, the the movement away from peat extraction has had a huge impact on my colleagues in the in the company. Uh, uh, in relation to uh, you know loss of fat peat extraction activity, this will support it um, somewhat. We know rewetting peat uh, from everything we've heard today has significant benefits, uh, particularly in relation to carbon storage. You know, trying to lock that remaining peat back into the ground, and then avoiding uh, emissions via a new trajectory. You know, the new trajectory of a wetter condition. And obviously, there's wider eco, eco -servicing, servicing systems uh, and benefits through biodiversity, water attenuation, water quality, landscape, and communities as well. So the key objective for me, it's really trying to optimize suitable hydrology and, and making the cutaway, uh, that, that wet footprint, wetter for longer. So like it has been said, uh, you know, by several um, contributors, um, and I'm sure Catherine's mentioned this and, and Alex already today, the starting point for a lot of these sites is raised bog, and we can't restore that in the short term. Um, so, like, we have to do, we have to manage expectations. There will be a development of other habitats, particularly in those sites where the majority of peat has been removed. But Borden Mona does have uh, some sites with uh, significant peat reserves, some of that can be re-wetted and uh, sent down a different trajectory. And this would be the outcome. Here, you know, David has talked about the sweet spot uh, or the Goldilocks um, point. Uh, this is this is an area that is exactly in that Goldilocks point. It is naturally developed uh, a sphagnum carpet. Uh, this is analogous to a carbon sink. And obviously, the remaining uh, residual um, peat is now re-wetted re and locked in the ground. So if we can get sphagnum to grow across these areas, similar areas. We know we're heading down that direction of potentially, obviously, reducing emissions and potentially developing a carbon sink again. But this is going to happen in a in a mosaic of different habitats. And again, you know, making that point where sites have been completely cut away or the majority of peat has been cut, uh, the targets are quite different. And, uh, you know, we have to accept we are going to get these different habitats of fen, 
reed beds, wet birch woodland, and so on. A lot of our cutaway we, is going to be uh, um, dry because of those underlying environmental conditions, and we have to accept that, and birch woodland will develop in those areas. So just to outline some of the, you know, some of the things that we're, what we want to do, okay, uh, and how we're going to do them. Um, here's a, a typical site, Edra Bog uh, in, you know, County Longford. And you can see majority of the bog is burr peat. Uh, but it has a quite a regular topography. And this is a real challenge for us. If we just block the drains, the majority of the bog uh, will still stay dry because the water will generally flow off these sloping areas and head down towards uh, those flat areas or, or areas that are uh, that will retain the water. Two minutes remaining, Mark. Thank you. So, and obviously we have a lot of um, deep peat in these areas as well. So we have to create uh, um, measures that will um, really hold water in these areas where it is challenged, where we are challenged in terms of uh, um, trying to re-wet. So again, we have um, we can model this in terms of hydrological modeling, and we can see that some areas are easier to rewet and some areas are harder to rewet. And so PCAS is very much focused on looking at measures that will improve conditions in these areas that are harder to rewet. This is what it looks like. This is um, some of the trials of Castle Gar. You can see the, the berms, we, you know, we're looking at creating these kind of modular cells to try to hold water at the peat surface. Some more pictures. And again, like this, is, this would be a key point here, you know, uh, getting fussy about it. Uh, the picture on the left, you know, that's a bog in a drier condition. It's still going to leak carbon. Uh, you know, and PCAS, you know, in terms of the ecology of this, we want it to be uh, wetter with that water level closer to the peat surface so that we get sphagnum um, colonization again. And again, it brings multiple benefits. Here, you know, here are birds that we haven't seen in Ireland breeding in 300 years, um, the common crane, and they're breeding on a board pneumonia bog. And, you know, hopefully, like this is unintended consequences. You know, hopefully we can develop a landscape where we will see more and more of these um, species and these birds in the future. And, you know, there's going to be multiple benefits out of this. Uh, and we're only really uh, touching, uh, you know, touching the surface of this. But if I could just leave you with one point, uh, uh, like my own journey, I, I started with Catherine in Board Pneumonia in 2009. And the first bog uh, she sent me out to survey with, with David was uh, the Durries bog. And there was a lot of bird peat there at that time. And uh, like now it's, it's a real wilderness. Uh, it's hard to walk through some of those sections. And sphagnum moss is appearing on that bog again, even though uh, we wouldn't expect sphagnum to uh, appear or be prominent in a, a site like that. No, it's not. It's not a significant part of that bog, but it is there. So like for me, like there's massive opportunity here for multiple benefits. And I, you know, my last point would be like we do have to be hopeful and optimistic uh, in terms of the future and, you know, develop this landscape, uh, you know, so that we can drive these benefits. And, you know, lastly, as Catherine said, like four years, uh, you know, how much, what can you do in four years? Well, sure, I, I keep saying now I've, I've 30 years left in me uh, to keep working on this, but I, I think that's va um, rapidly reducing now. I, I'd say it's down to 20. But anyway, um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, it was a bit of a downbeat ending there. You're a young fella yet, and uh, you have many more years in those legs. Um, yeah, it's certainly a very interesting PCAS uh, with the potential for absolutely changing the landscape of the Midlands, you know, certainly, you know, for in the short term, medium term and possibly forever. So we look forward to uh, hearing more of this uh, uh, in, the, in the months and years to come. OK, uh, next talker is a uh, great pleasure with my, my, my co-conspirator cool here in this uh, session. It's Francis Macken of RPS Consultants. And uh, Francis will be talking a little bit about the nuts and bolts that underpin uh, restoration, but a, a talk entitled Restoration Planning for Raised Bogs. The floor is yours, sir. Thanks, David. Hopefully you can all see that. Perfect. So, great. Okay, um, so 
I suppose in eight minutes, I'm going to try and very quickly take you through the process of, of planning restoration for, for these raised bogs and how we've gone about that over the past number of years, in particular uh, with National Parks and Wildlife Service on a number of the designated sites. So uh, not to uh, stay on this point for too long, but obviously we know from some of the talks yesterday, in particular from Lawrence Gill, that hydrology is really key to uh, the restoration and the maintenance, I suppose, of good ecological conditions on these raised bogs. We require a very stable and high water table, and that requires us to have adequate depth and frequency of effective rainfall. We need a very low rate of infiltration through the peat, which is typically the case, but we know from the work that Shane presented yesterday that there can be bogs where that's not, not necessarily the case. But I suppose for many sites, what we really need is very gentle topographic gradients. And as Mark just outlined in terms of some of the bogs that will be looked at for PCAS, dealing with that slope across the bog is one of the key challenges. So what we want to see is more of this, which is central ecotope, which occurs um, typically in areas that are very gently sloping. And when we get towards the margins, we start to see that micro topography disappearing, the water table dropping below the surface, and I suppose drier uh, species coming in and, and the loss of sphagnum. So we know a lot of this based on the work that was carried out as part of some of the studies that Matthias outlined uh, this morning. And it, it was actually fantastic to hear because I've learned so much from, uh, from the Green Book or the, the Bog Bible, as I like to call it, um, about how these systems operate. And what we've been able to do uh, with the research that was carried out uh, as part of those studies in the 80s and 90s is to take them a little bit further and use the technology that we have available today in terms of computer processing and high resolution data sets to, to develop models. And these eco-hydrological models allow us to predict where has the best potential on raised bogs for very effective restoration. And this is an example of, of some of the work that we've done that really has, has only been possible because of the very detailed ecological studies and ecological mapping that's available that allow us to calibrate ecological and, uh, conditions to the hydrology and topography. We've been able to take this uh, further and look at cutover areas. And uh, I suppose it's, it's, it's not as effective as looking at uh, the undisturbed or high bog situation uh, because on the cutover, we're dealing with a very different situation. And Matthias outlined it very nicely this morning in terms of the, the very stark figures of the, re the restoration of 10,000 hectares in the Netherlands and the very small figure of 23 hectares and now 18 hectares that's left that's actively peat accumulating. And this is what we're really trying to do with these models is to identify the areas that have the best potential to become peat accumulating and therefore allow us to prioritize our measures because it's much more effective to restore areas of high bog that still have potential uh, to become peat forming than it is deal with a, a situation like cutover where the conditions are um, much more difficult to deal with and we don't have that acrotelm layer that regulates uh, the the flow off the bog. So what we're able to do with the LIDAR information that we have is to develop eco-hydrological analysis to give us a good idea of what the proposal should be for restoration for these sites. We're able to prepare the models that I, I just outlined and prioritize where measures would be most effective. And obviously we need detailed field surveys to verify our findings uh, on the ground to make sure we're not missing anything or overlooking anything in particular. A key step here is really multidisciplinary uh, work in terms of collaboration with the ecologists. So this is a very key step in our development of restoration plans. And this is an example of Scohoboy Bog and NHA in County Tipperary that has a very active uh, community involved in the restoration and has been, uh, I suppose, through a number of phases of restoration, initially with Quiltia and more recently with National Parks and Wildlife Service, uh, a, a project that was managed by Board Nimona. So what we're able to do with all of this is put together very detailed proposals with accurate costings and allows us really to focus in on where we would get the most benefits from restoration. And this has been done for all 53 special areas of conservation, as well as several of the NHS in our network. More recently, we have began looking at enhanced measures and we, we saw some of this work yesterday in Terry Morley's presentation. This is uh, Clonkrow Bog in County West Meath, which is part of the Carapate project. 
And we were able to use uh, the modeling techniques that I've outlined to develop proposals for enhanced measures, in this case, bonding. And what we're trying to do with that bonding is basically deal with very harsh conditions on the cutover surface where we've lost that acrotelm there. And we're trying to introduce these bonds to effectively regulate the, the flow off the bog and, and maintain soggy conditions, very similar to what Mark had outlined in his previous presentation. And these measures, uh, while they're very effective, they have to be targeted at the right places. And when they're targeted at the right places, they give us multiple ecosystem services benefits in terms of habitat restoration and improvements in biodiversity, get us that carbon uh, sequestration, the carbon sink that David had just talked about, provides benefits in terms of flow attenuation, improvements in water quality, and offer also offers opportunities for amenity, rec recreation and ecotourism, as well as education. And this site at Cloncrow is, is probably one of the best examples around, along with Scoho Boy and bogs like Abbey Lakes, where there's a really active community and they're actively going out, taking people to the bog, helping people to understand what's, what's going on on these sites, how they're being restored and their importance. Two minutes remaining, Francis. Okay, thank you. Um, so you can see how we can use the topographic information across these sites to target our bonding locations. And what we're targeting is very shallow depths of water. And the reason that we want a little bit of surface water is that uh, during the summer, our rate of evapotranspiration increases uh, while we ha can have larger gaps between when we're getting that precipitation. So we need to build in a bit of resilience into the system. And this comes back to when we're you know, the, the point that Matthias made this morning in terms of the very small area uh, that has been restored, it's because it's so much more difficult to restore peat forming conditions once the surface has been very badly restored. So it's important to maintain what we've got and only implement measures like this uh, in the appropriate areas. And you can see from this image uh, the, the results uh, in, in terms of very uh, substantial re-wetting re across the site. And this will be I uh, investigated further as Terry outlined yesterday in terms of carbon emissions as well as water table dynamics. So while the presentation focused on raised bogs, just very quickly to outline that we can use some of these methods for blanket bogs, as, and this is an example as part of the CAN project, where we're able to use the, the topographic data collected from LIDAR to map out eroded peat tags and provide a detailed specification in terms of where dams should go and where reprofiling is required of the peat tags. So in conclusion, uh, I would say that water is key to the health of our bogs. We really have to have a detailed understanding of, of where that water is coming from and where it's going to in order to successfully restore these sites. A uh, multidisciplinary approach is absolutely essential for effective restoration. And we can see that with the best examples that we've got of restoration it ha has been where we've had that multidisciplinary work together, ecologists, hydrologists, engineers, scientists, as well as the community being involved in the restoration work. And finally, the last point I'd just like to make is that it's really important that we learn from our mistakes uh, in, in my job, in terms of developing these restoration plans, I've actually learned more from mistakes, uh, particularly my own mistakes and mistakes uh, that have ma been made in previous restoration schemes. That actually is something that I think we really uh, should focus on more. And uh, we have our best practice guidance, but potentially we should think about putting something out there like poor practice guidance uh, to help us learn more. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. Uh, that was a fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, Speaking of somebody who can barely switch on a computer uh, by themselves, I think this is uh, just I just love uh, love listening to this kind of stuff, and particularly given that going forward, that finance for restoration could be a fine a finite resource. It really I think is important. We have to get as much bang for our buck as possible in targeting areas that uh, are uh, more amenable to uh, restoration and rewetting. It's, it's so important. So uh, thank you, Francis. Um, our next uh, speaker is my pleasure to introduce uh, Ben Geary from the National uh, University of Ireland, Cork, NUI Cork. And uh, Ben will be talking about the future of Peatlands past, community, archaeology, and cultural heritage. So all yours, Ben. Okay, um, good, um, good morning, everybody. Hopefully everyone can see that. We can, yeah. It's a confirmation. Excellent. Thank you very much. 
Okay, so thank you for the um, opportunity to speak today. Um, the future of Peatlands past, community archaeology and cultural heritage. I'm presenting on behalf of the Wet Futures Project. Um, that's myself, uh, Dr. Rosie Everett and Dr. Kim Davis, who began on this project a couple of years ago. Um, this project uh, was initially funded by uh, the JPIC scheme, Horizon 2020, uh, by the Heritage Council, who's financial uh, support is, um, is very gratefully acknowledged. That funding's actually uh, ran out last year, but we're continuing this work through, um, through other funding pots and the project remains um, active. Okay, so, so as we've heard already, um, when we talk about peatland restoration, we're talking as much about the restoration of, of biophysical or physical functions of peatlands, but also the restoration of uh, people's relationships socially and culturally with peatlands. We've heard some great talks about that already from Kate Flood and Monica and Lawrence and so forth and other people refer to this as well. So it's not just about carbon and biodiversity of course, um, as we, we, we heard yesterday from uh, Kathy and Ellen's talk, Irish peatlands are remarkable archives of past environments, people and landscapes. Um, an important point to note here, and this is kind of often slips under the radar for some people, this is a recognised ecosystem service, service that's provided by peatlands. Um, it's often missed out or it often slips off the agenda for, for a variety of, of often understandable reasons, but that's an important point to make. Another important point here is that at least kind of, a, I suppose, ontologically speaking, in ecosystem services, all services are on a similar level and plane, and that's an important thing to note. So whilst obviously carbon and biodiversity is critical, other things are important as well. Anyway, we could say more about that, but let's move on. So what is the value of archaeology and paleoecology in this context? Well, very simply put, archaeology helps us understand change, changing landscapes, the records that are preserved in bogs. This can help us understand essentially, and very simply put, where we've come from and where we are going. So this kind of partly lies behind the beginning of, of Wet Futures uh, back in 2018, when we began in the project advocating in the areas of policy and practice, Community, uh, communicating and seeking community collaborations in the area of peatlands heritage. We began working with the Community Wetlands Forum who are a partner on this project. And there's an at the Abbey Leaks workshop, which um, be, and then just literally almost just after we began, COVID happened. So we're only just now really um, catching up with the work that we had planned pre COVID. And this is really just, um, just flagging up some projects that, that are happening and forthcoming. So um, we've been working with uh, the Drummond Bog Project there, and we've been sampling their peatland um, and taking samples for pale environmental assessment and radiocarbon dating. We've also recently been working with the West Cavern Bog Association as well, and um, that's a shot of Fartrim Bog. Um, three generations of um, the family who um, own or own part of that bog and used to cut peat, and are now moving towards the understanding of the importance of um, restoration and also a project that we're hoping to undertake investigating the environmental history and evolution of that bog. We also have another project forthcoming uh, with Rhea Nathan and Neil and colleagues um, uh, that's funded by the Creative Climate Action Fund. Um, here's just a quick plug for you. Uh, the Drumming Bog Project um, next weekend, is that right? Yeah, the weekend after one coming, 15th, 6th of October. Um, there'll be two days of events uh, in Drummond Hall, Drummond County Carlow. We'll be talking about the results of the radiocarbon dating of that project, and there'll be other events and interactions based around the natural and cultural history of the bog as well. So if you can make it all along to that, that would be fantastic. And again, we've been working with Kathy Fitzgerald, Jules Michael, Martin Little, and other people as part of that, collaborating very closely on this project. Perhaps you want to know more about the archaeology of Irish peatlands, uh, something that I think has been an issue um, uh, we established this quite early in the project is sometimes it's people are not quite clear where to get information on, on Irish bog archaeology. There's obviously a lot of academic work out there, perhaps there's less access, accessible public material if you like. Um, we're hoping to launch this, this uh, brochure that we produced, I think brochure is the right word, uh, with the Community Wetlands Forum very soon. Um, this was collaborating with the artist John Flynn, Irish Peatland Archaeology by Numbers that outlines really and presents images from the diversity that we've heard about already of archaeological material in Irish bogs and we're hoping that might be a kind of entry point of use to community projects and individuals who are interested in finding out more about the archaeology that is um, that is out there or was out there in Irish bogs there is of course material still preserved in situ okay so um, and just to kind of flag this as well 
um, will be COP26 is of course in everyone's minds and thoughts and um, large, amount, large amount of interest and projects will be being presented there. There will be a, a session on peatland archaeology at COP26 on the 10th of November. That will be an online session and we'll be discussing some of the issues that have come up um, in the course of the conference about the relationship of archaeology to uh, policy and strategy in terms of peatland uh, restoration and rehabilitation for climate change. That is in collaboration with Historic Environment Scotland, uh, the wonderful IECM Peatlands Programme, uh, Historic England and the Global Peatlands Initiative with other partners involved in that as well. So keep an eye on that this space if you'd like to tune in for the online session or indeed if you're actually at COP there's going to be um, an evening uh, physical session hopefully as well so please get in touch with us. Two minutes okay. remaining then. That's nearly me okay so I seem to have timed it quite well hopefully I've not gone too fast through there so just to tie up. Um, the, Ro the Roman Orator Cicero said, not to know what happened before you were born is, to, is, is always to remain a child. And I think what we have learned from this conference, and particularly when we talk about the archaeological and paleontological record, we cannot understand the present and the future without understanding the past. And Peatlands presents a remarkable opportunity in terms of cultural and environmental records. Um, a shout out to other groups and individuals. Do you want to know more about the archaeology and natural history of your site? There's work we can do, both ourselves and other colleagues. Referring to um, Lawrence's comments earlier, this includes what we might call contemporary archaeology. As peat cutting ceases, essentially the infrastructure, the memories, the people who are involved in that become part of, if you like, the contemporary archaeological record. That's very important and it's a point well made. There is huge potential for engagement and collaboration through these um, areas of archaeology and paleoecology that also we think bring people into these broader discussions about carbon biodiversity and other essential ecosystem services. So please do contact us, myself, Rosie, other archaeological colleagues out there as well. So that's finally really an appeal to the conference. As I think we heard yesterday, the archaeological record, it belongs to all of us. This is something that is, is our past, that it's largely been destroyed. There's still material out there. There are still things we can do with it. So please do bear that in mind and please speak to us. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, yeah, some very wise words there. Um, we are in possession of this wonderful resource. Um, it's very easy to look forward all the time and, and, and view climate change, uh, and try to take actions to uh, mitigate climate change. But we often and do forget our past and the, the information and data that is in that peat that also will provide information going forward in terms of climate change, not only uh, 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 just from the, the resource itself. So thank you very much for Ben for flagging all that. Um, our final uh, speaker today um, is Philip Blackwell from the Department of Ag, Food and the Marine. And uh, Philip will uh, talk to us about agricultural peat soils. It's all yours, Philip. That's great. Uh, thank you, David, and, and uh, good morning, everyone. So delighted to be here. Uh, I'll just try to get my screen the slideshow. Perfect. So everyone can see that. Okay, perfect. So great. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Philip Blackwell. Uh, I work with the Climate Change and Bioenergy Policy Division in the Department of Agriculture. Uh, so I'm just here today to talk about the our agricultural peat soils, uh, just to cover what exactly uh, we're talking about in terms of agricultural peat soils, uh, just to run through some of the targets and the actual uh, work that the department are uh, investing in in this area. Uh, so I suppose it's just to start with our climate action plan target um, and in that uh, the peat soils are included in the Lulu safe target. So our target is to achieve 26.8 million tonnes abatement through Lulu CF actions over the period 2021 to 2030. Uh, and this, uh, among an, a number of measures, uh, this includes uh, reaching 40,000 hectares of reduced management intensity of grasslands on drained organic soils. So in total, the cumulative abatement of that over the uh, 10 years adds up to about 4.4 million tonnes. So it's quite a, a success, substantial um, part of the 26.8 million tonne target. Uh, in terms of what area we're talking about or, or what is the uh, agricultural peat soil, so it's organic peat soils that have been drained and used for agriculture use over the last number of years. Uh, 
generally it's defined as having an, an agricultural activity being carried out under the uh, basic payment scheme as part of the uh, pillar one of CAP uh, and, it, and it receives payments. Uh, and it's mostly reclaimed raised bog. So it's on the periphery of, of rain, raised bogs that have been reclaimed over the last number of years. Uh, it's this target, I suppose, and, and what I'm focusing on today is, is, the, is that area rather than the blanket peats or any of the work that's, that's ongoing on, on the blanket peats on, on the hill, hill land. Uh, there's a number of, I suppose, different terminology used, uh, peat soils under agricultural management, farm peatland, uh, and carbon rich soils uh, drained uh, organic uh, and drained organic agricultural soil. So this is the area I suppose we're concerned with, a raised bog example in, in Longford, uh, on the border of Longford and Westmead. So you see where it's been um, extracted and drained, the, 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 um, the, the last remaining intact bog in the centre there. And we're mainly concerned in terms of the periphery of, of this bog and, and I suppose the, the transition between the actual bog and the grasslands on the periphery. So um, you see some fields out in the outer edge that you wouldn't, uh, in isolation, you wouldn't think that they're peat soils. And I suppose they can be termed as, as buried peat because they, the peat is in underneath the perfectly, I suppose, from a, a viewpoint, uh, um, perennial rye grass field that's being grazed uh, and managed for agriculture. So it's, it's roughly in, in approximately 300,000 hectares we're looking at and, and likely more than that. Uh, and the issue for climate change is that soils with high organic matter, if drained, allow additional air into the soil. Uh, and this breaks down the organic matter, releasing large amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere. In total, on a, on a national basis, as reported in the inventory, our total grassland area uh, emits 6.9 million tonnes CO2 equivalent, and that's on a net basis. So that's taken into account uh, the sequestration rate of our mineral soils of about 2 million tonnes total. So it's a substantial emission from these peat soils that needs to be uh, reduced somehow. And I suppose, and, and it's been talked about over this peatlands gather a number of days, is to, is to reduce emissions by keeping the soil moist so as to, uh, to stop that, that um, breakdown of organic matter. Sorry, now I'm just moving stuff. Sorry, my computer is frozen up there for a second. If you can. Oh, yeah. So, sorry about that. So, in terms of the actual uh, focus areas that the, the Department of Agriculture has identified. Uh, we're really focusing on, on three main areas. So uh, we're investing in, in pilot projects um, to really learn about this, this area that hasn't been, uh, measures haven't been carried out before. Uh, so pilot projects will hopefully guide us uh, on that in, in terms of um, translating into larger in, environmental schemes. Uh, we're investing in, in mapping because uh, the, the maps aren't uh, in need of refinement of the, the peat soil maps. And we're investing in, in verification of CO2 emissions and removals from, from these peat soils. In terms of the pilot projects, then, and, and as I had a presentation already in terms of um, the pilot, uh, the farm peat project, um, the. Uh, Two minutes remaining there, Philip. Okay, perfect, thanks. Uh, there's a, a call put out in, in August 2020 for uh, a locally led European Inv Innovation Partnership, an EIEP project. Um, that, sorry, I'm getting messages here. So it's to, uh, I suppose, the aim of these pilot projects is to, to scale up the actions and measures into larger environmental programs for the next CAP. So uh, as, a, as, a, as a result of this call, there's two groups, Nature Based Agri Solutions Limited, that's the Farm Peat Project, and Green Restoration Ireland were successful and will receive over 2 million to complete their projects. In terms of mapping then, there's a, a repeat project that's just about to kick off, uh, led by TCD and uh, NUIG. Um, and this will provide a, a range of benefits, including accuracy of peatland, improving the accuracy of peatland maps, uh, presently, uh, precisely identifying these agricultural uh, drained uh, peat soils, and I suppose providing detailed information for policymakers. Uh, we also have other programs uh, kicking off the National Soil Survey Pilot Project uh, program, which will 
um, pay farmers to take uh, soil tests, which will improve maps. There's also the farm environmental study, and then uh, just announced this week, there's the soil moisture monitoring network, and this will all feed into improved data and improved mapping areas. So just in terms of the, the repeat project, um, so this is uh, what the main aim of the repeat project will be to map, I suppose, to look at the historic maps, the bog commissioners maps, and compare it to orthophoto of today's uh, maps. And you'll see on the right hand side that the original outline of the map of the bog 200 years ago has been reclaimed and used for agriculture and more than likely uh, the, the uh, peat soils are now under these grassland areas that you see on the map, uh, which will there'll be a big area of this will be ground truthing to verify that as well. In terms then of uh, verification of CO2 emissions and removals from these soils, uh, we've invested in uh, the National Agricultural Soil and Carbon Observatory, uh, which is a network of eddy covariance flux towers funded by DAFN and will be managed by Chagas. Uh, so it's a variety of, of sites, uh, which will include uh, agricultural grasslands, mineral soils and peatlands. So it's the ability to determine actual emissions from of CO2, CH4, or uh, methane, and N2O. So it's the all the greenhouse gas emissions uh, from these areas. And it also includes sequestration in, in iris specific conditions. So it's to really to improve the, the inventory um, and the, I suppose the, the uncertainty that's there in the inventory around uh, emissions from, from soils and especially from, from peatlands. So it's to verify the emission factors on uh, iris specific uh, soils. Part of those, I suppose, part of those experiments will include um, re-wetting, so before and after re-wetting. So we'll get a, a correct determination of exactly how much uh, emissions are saved in terms of reducing management intensity or, or re-wetting of, of these areas. So just to conclude, uh, I suppose, uh, just to say that, that the measures on, on drained agricultural managed organic soils are a large part of our climate change targets in the newly CF sector. Uh, there is large uncertainties in, in underlying data and emission factors related to organic soils um, and DAFM have a, 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 a invest in heavily in, in research and data refinement to help close these knowledge gaps. So uh, thanks very much. I'm open to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Philip. Uh, very interesting, very topical uh, presentation uh, given uh, Ireland's uh, problems in uh, Lulu CF uh, uh, emissions at the moment. Um, in terms of the, the new data, we have some time just for some questions here before we, we, we close up. But uh, if I could uh, be cheeky and ask a question uh, on, you know, uh, in terms of reporting, uh, at the moment we report tier one values. And uh, as you alluded to there, it's a, where the Irish grasslands are net emitters of around 7 million tonnes of CO2 per year. Uh, what are your thoughts if we can move to tier two? Do you think or can you foresee any sizable change in that emission factor? Oh, not the emission factor, the emissions. Yeah, I, we do work on IPCC um, emission factors. They're not uh, Ireland specific. Um, I suppose there's been some early testing and I think there, there, there might be actually scope for them being overstated in terms of um, uh, Irish conditions that the um, the emissions reported are larger from the peat soils, drained peat soils, than than what what might be actually happening on the ground. So I suppose that's why we have such big investment in in these um, in in the flux towers and, and to get verified data in in Irish specific conditions. Um, I suppose that comes with the caveat then that if there's lower emissions from these air, from each hectare of of uh, drained uh, organic soils um, there's also less savings in terms of of reduced management intensity so I suppose that's why we really need stronger data uh, uh, on this um, on these emissions to really verify uh, our, our targets uh, reaching yeah I think the, the, the scale of the task uh, was very evident yesterday uh, Bernard uh, Hyde of uh, EPA had produced this uh, very nice uh, map showing the the real mosaic of uh, land use options within a very small scale and difficulties in mapping those. And then listening to your talk as well, you, we really are, you have to be cognizant of the, the carbon content of even the, the grassland, the, the type of management. Uh, there was a recent paper, uh, I think in Nature, Chris Evans and, and authors, 
where they showed that uh, you could still maintain a certain amount of farming activity, even at reduced water table levels, uh, that didn't in necessarily impact on the, the farming activities, but reduced emissions as well. So factoring all that in as well, you know, I can see the scale that's uh, facing you guys, uh, it's quite daunting. And uh, we certainly look forward to uh, hearing the results uh, uh, in the years ahead. Unfortunately, we're bang on time. Uh, we've run out of time, should I say. Um, I big, big thank you to everybody that presented today. Uh, huge thank you to everybody that tuned in. Um, 171 I see here in front of me. Um, I hope you found it interesting. Uh, the next session begins at 12.30 sharp. Perhaps get a bit of lunch, go out for a nice wee walk, do a bit of meditation, do all three. Uh, and thank you very much for everything. See you, see you soon. Bye-bye now.